but I do appreciate all of you coming because um, I thought this might not be a very full house tonight. And in fact, my colleagues commented that I may not have put out enough shares, and I said, "Well, you know, I just call it the way I thought it was going to be." So, wow, what a beautiful packed house tonight. Uh, Dr. Sean Olive is here from Harmon. We were talking about research and headphones and other goodies, and we also have some business to do tonight. Um, we have an election that's occurring now. If you are an APS member, you are invited to participate in the election. And in fact, that uh, Dr. Olive. Well, Sean Olive is one of those guys that used to hang out in Canada <coughs> with Floyd Toll. He told me to make it short, so now he's what chief something or other or something like that at Harmon. He knows a lot about audio, and uh, well, come on, talk. <laughs> <laughs> So, do I have a mic? Do I have to turn it on? No, it's on. Oh, really? Yeah, you're there. There's no live sound. It's acoustic. <laughs> oh, old school. <laughs> That's just we're recording. I don't know if it's where I can't tell your feedback. So, uh, you don't happen to have a laser pointer? Yeah, I got so anyway, I'll start. Um, so tonight I want to talk a bit about headphones. And uh, someone already introduced Todd Walty. That's, that's, that's an interesting story that I'll send back to him. Uh, but yeah, Todd's a very, he, he likes data, he likes information. Uh, I somehow suspect he's an atheist. <laughs> um, the other author is uh, Beth McMullen, who's just joined us two years ago, and uh, this is a, a team effort. So anything I talk about tonight is, you know, these people deserve credit as well. So about two years ago, we got interested in headphones, and up until that point, uh, I've mostly been focusing on loudspeakers. Uh, acoustics of rooms and how speakers interact with rooms. And uh, I never thought that headphones were going to be as popular because in 1988, I was, 1985, I met Floyd at the National Research Council in Ottawa and I had a pair of headphones as a student that I just threw out and never thought I'd ever use them again. But, you know, with the iPod, the iPhone, smartphones, the last few years, there's been an explosion in headphone. Uh, I think it's now an eight, eight to nine billion dollar business annually. But what, what the funny thing was, was as we started to listen to them and measure them, they were all over the map and it kind of reminded us of loudspeakers 30 years ago where everyone had an opinion but uh, there were no scientific listening tests, everyone was measuring them differently and it, it all seemed like deja vu. So we said, why don't we just sort of apply the same kind of science to headphones and see if we can come up with a better understanding of how they work and how to measure them and, and whether people like them. And if you look in the literature, we found that there, there weren't many standards, meaningful standards. There's, there was this standard that recommended you, they be diffuse field calibrated or free field calibrated. But when you start measuring manufacturers, you find that very few of them are actually applying it. And even within the same manufacturer, you find one model to the next is, are entirely different. It's like there's no design philosophy at all. And the challenge is that controlled tests are pretty easy to do on speakers. You, know, you, can, you, know, you can put a curtain up and hide the brand, hide, hide the, uh, the nuisance variables. But with a headphone, it's difficult to do. So as a result, there haven't been any tests really recorded in the literature, very few. Uh, but we had to get, in order to understand what people like and how to measure a headphone, you have to do a listening test because it's, it's really the perception uh, and the subjective ratings that tell you what matters. So that, that was the first challenge. So uh, we, the questions we asked ourselves, how do we do a control blind test? Uh, is there a preferred target response, which is essentially the frequency response? And we speculated maybe since 99% of all recordings people listen to through headphones were 
designed and mixed to sound good on, in, in loud, through loudspeakers. So we thought maybe that would be a good starting point. And then at the time, uh, Harmon had gone through a lot of uh, hiring and reorganization, and we had a whole new bunch of marketing people on staff. And uh, not knowing much about audio, they thought they, they just follow the money. And if, you know, <laughs> what, what manufacturer sells the most headphones? They must have a <coughs> magical sound. And, uh, and because mostly kids are buying them, uh, and we don't like the sound. They said, well, maybe kids have different tastes. So th th this is a question that keeps getting thrown around around again. And then finally, uh, there was this question from marketing whether different cultures have different tastes. Uh, over the years, we've heard the same thing about loudspeakers, that Germans like very bright sound, British like tight bass, Americans like big, boomy bass and the Japanese like no bass, they like bright sound. This is, these are the sorts of things that I've been told by marketing departments and even uh, you know, audio uh, researchers. So in the last two years, uh, we, pu you know, we published, uh, well, four of these papers have been published. These two are gonna be presented at AES in Los Angeles, but we've been fairly uh, open about our research findings and sharing it with, with the world. And the hope is that uh, people will test it, they'll argue it, and perhaps you know, it could, if, if there's a consensus, maybe we can come up with a standard. Uh, there's no point in trying to patent this stuff because anyone can go out and measure a headphone and find easily what, what the target is. So, uh, so we, we've presented a bunch of papers, and I'm gonna talk about this one, this one, I'm not gonna talk about this one and I'll briefly talk about this one and this one you'll actually have to uh, buy the paper or go to the convention. So that's, that's the sales pitch for the LA convention. But it's gonna be a really good convention. So the first paper, uh, we basically just asked this question, do trained listeners agree on what make a, make, makes a headphone sound good? And we selected some headphones, uh, some popular ones, uh, some ones that are highly regarded, the Audis LCD2. If you look through any of the uh, uh, Interfidelity or any of the Hi-Fi uh, websites, you'll find that people really, there's a, there's a big enthusiastic crowd for this. Of course, this headphone I think is the number one selling headphone, so we had to throw that in there. This is also a very popular headphone. I, I flew today uh, from LA. And everyone in first class had these headphones. Uh, and anytime you fly anywhere, you always see people in business class wearing these. So it's a very popular headphone. And this one we just included because it was really popular amongst a certain demographic of young uh, consumers. And the other thing I wanna point out, the price range is quite, quite wide. And we have different types of headphones. So we have open back, closed. This is open. We've got closed with active noise cancellation. Same here. And this is a, a standard closed headphone. So, so our first stab at doing a blind test, we, we brought in a subject. We had a test administrator. And they would simply substitute these four sets of headphones at a time. So we did level matching. Uh, and the, the listener would basically give ratings on each headphone and whenever they switched to a different headphone, the administrator had to go do this method of, a, of substitution. So it's a fairly uh, time consuming, uh, terrible task for the listener, terrible for the administrator, but we're essentially removing things like brand, price, and uh, celebrity endorsement from the test. Uh, what we what we couldn't remove is the fact that every headphone weighs, you know, has a different weight, and the Audis is clearly the heaviest one. It feels like you've got a, a clamp on your head. It's got a very high <laughs> clamping force. So after two or three trials, the listener starts to say, "Well, that's the heavy one that really hurts my ears." Uh, last time I gave it a, a seven. I think I'll give it the same rating. So we haven't completely removed the biases, but at least we're removing. Uh, visual uh, and psychological biases related to brand, price, and appearance. 
So uh, what we found uh, with these trained listeners, we did several trials with different music, and these are the mean ratings for those six headphones. And these deep green dotted curves are the, the perceived spectral balance of the headphones. So we've trained our listeners when they hear speakers or automobiles or headphones, uh, the, in their minds they can actually draw in several bands what they think the spectral balance is. And obviously if they think it's flat and smooth, uh, there's an association that that sounds good and they give it a higher rating. Uh, this headphone here, they thought it was kind of thin sounding, even though it measures pretty flat in the bass. This one was a bit of a, you know, this one they thought was a bit boomy. Uh, this headphone, it was interesting because they said overall it sounds rather thin, even though the measured frequency response shows a bass boost. And what we found was this is a closed back headphone where you have to have a very good seal in order to get decent bass. And what we found, we, we started measuring this headphone by putting microphones in listeners' ears and actually measuring the, the transfer function. We found that it was highly variable depending on how it fit the listener. So right away, we've identified a, a nuisance variable here uh, that if you don't get a good seal, a good fit, you're going to get a lot of variability in the listener's ratings. And this is, you know, so you have to be very careful of closed headphones when you read reviews. Uh, if you send it to five reviewers, you might get a different review <coughs> of how well it fit them. The same is true with in-ear headphones. Uh, the last headphone you can see, this is very, uh, I'm trying to remember which one. Yeah, this is a very popular headphone. You can see it's got a big suck out here. People <laughs> perceive it as sounding boomy. And, and lastly, we got this, this quite colorful headphone. <laughs> <laughs> talking about the sound, <coughs> not, the, not the color. It, it, it's perceived as being very boomy, very dull, and it got the lowest rating. So uh, this is all measured on a standard ITU uh, uh, pinna with a, uh, an ear simulator uh, made by Grass. So these are all pretty standard measurements. You can go out and buy this and be in the business of measuring headphones tomorrow. But how we measure these, we do several Reseeding, so we do at least, usually five or six reseeding, so that we average out any errors related to how it fits, uh, how it's positioned on the on the measurement device. Quick question. Yeah. On these plots, are they roughly the same kind of uh, y-axis scaling? Yeah, they're all uh, 10 dB between. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it goes from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So for the off-axis data, you just have to turn your head. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, you know, we generally found good agreement, notwithstanding these uh, leakage effects that vary among listeners. And the listeners generally preferred the headphones, which they perceived as being the most neutral and evenly balanced. And we found, uh, although we haven't calculated, there seems to be good correlation between the measured response and the perceived spectral balance and the preference rating. Uh, and uh, this was encouraging because it, it's not a, a random thing. There, there's actually a, a relationship between how it measures and how it's preferred. And then we found that the, this base leakage is a real issue that we have to pay attention to and control when we do tests. So the next uh, experiment we did, we were, rather than measure a bunch of headphones and figure out empirically what people prefer, uh, let's actually take a headphone and equalize it to different target responses and see is there, a, is there a, uh, a correlation between how it measures and what the preference is. So we looked at some of the standards and uh, one of the most popular ones since the 80s is this diffuse field calibration, and it's based on the premise that the headphones should produce the same acoustic response at the eardrum as a speaker in a diffuse sound field. So if you were put a speaker in a, in a very reflective diffuse field, uh, like a reverberation chamber, they're saying that's what you should measure at the headphone. The free field is basically uh, based on the same premise, except it should be what you would measure if you had a speaker in an anechoic chamber. 
So right away, uh, th this, this standard doesn't seem to make much sense because uh, when we listen to speakers in rooms, most of the time a typical room is neither diffuse nor free field. You're getting a, a combination of a very strong uh, direct sound, but depending on the room and the directivity <coughs> of the speaker, you're also going to get some strong first reflections. It, 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 there's no way that a typical room is anywhere near a free field or a diffuse field, but it's somewhere in between. The other thing is, is this standard ignores the fact that most recordings are made in, in rooms where you get some reinforcement from the room and the bass in particular. And it can be anywhere from three to six dB, depending on how close you put the speakers to a boundary, uh, depending on the size of the room. But you know, just instinctively, if you play a recording through a headphone that's flat in the bass, it's gonna sound too thin because it was made uh, in a monitoring situation that was a lot different than that. So we said, you know, headphones that are calibrated to these standards are gonna sound too thin and too bright uh, for most recordings. So we went into uh, our room. This is a reference, this is a room we designed at Harman. Uh, there's several of them, but it's basically a, a, a room that's uh, supposed to simulate a, an average domestic room. And we basically went in there and uh, we basically measured at the eardrum the average response from a seven channel system. And we did, we did spatial averaging with the head at different head positions. And that became sort of what we considered the in-room loudspeaker response. And these are the seven channels those speakers measured uh, you know, using spatial averages. And you can see that this is before we apply our, our uh, target curve to the speaker, but they're basically very similar. So on that basis, we came up, we then uh, applied different equalizations to that, that target response. So we had uh, the original headphone with no EQ, uh, equalized to a diffuse field response based on work done by Hammershaw and Moeller. Uh, another one based on Moeller. Then we had this one. This was a uh, was based on a study by Lorho, who uh, he was at Nokia at the time. I think he's now at Apple designing headphones. But uh, his idea was that the diffuse field uh, response has this 10 dB bump at about 3 kilohertz. And he thought, he, based on listening tests, he thought it should be about 3 dB, so he's greatly reduced this, uh, this resonance at 3K, and of course the bass is flat. Then we had a free field uh, target response, and then we had one based on uh, the, the target we measured of a speaker in a room, and, and there were slight variations, one uh, where uh, it was based on the speaker equalized to a, a target curve that we'd uh, used before, and one where it's slightly modified with less bass and less treble. So we did this uh, experiment using two different headphones, one that was uh, relatively inexpensive, but it's an open back, so it's, and we found that this headphone is very consistent, so we've measured it on many listeners, and it, uh, because it's open and it fits people well, there's very little variation due to leakage. <coughs> And then finally, we did this uh, same test through a very expensive headphone that uh, is highly praised for its sound quality. And it's also open back, so it, it, it's a good headphone for doing these tests. So we had listeners uh, evaluate these different targets. Uh, they were trained listeners, and we used three different music programs with one repeat. So in the first test, uh, we found that this, this new target based on a speaker in a room was the most preferred. It was uh, strongly preferred over the diffuse field by Mueller, uh, as well as a, a slight variation. The one by Lorho was basically tied with that. And then we had the unequalized headphone, and the free field was the least preferred out of all the choices. What did the response of the JBL Target 1 look like? Uh, I, c I can show you that in a, in a few more slides. Sure. Is your scale linear? So if you multiply any of those to 
No, it's a it's a preference scale. So most of these scales are not quite linear. Uh, people's there's a lot of scaling biases that can creep in. The, but the way we define this scale is uh, if, if it's more than two points, that represents a strong preference. One point separation is a moderate preference and half a point is a slight preference. So uh, if you look at the next test where we use the ADIS LCD2, uh, this is a slightly modified target where we have less base and less treble. It was uh, strongly preferred over the original target and again, we find that the free field is the least preferred and the unequalized headphone is somewhere in the middle. So we found that uh, you know, overall this, this target response that tries to simulate a speaker in a room uh, was preferred over the, the standards. And that people, you know, even though this had a bit of a bass boost, people thought it was the most neutral and balanced. So even though we're adding some room gain to the headphone target, uh, people don't perceive it as being boomy or bass heavy. <clears throat> so the third experiment we did was uh, we, we kind of stepped back and said, you know, we're, we're trying to simulate a speaker in a room, but we haven't really done a lot of tests on whether that speaker in-room target is, is optimal or whether it, it, you know, it could be further improved. So uh, we did this experiment where uh, we did two experiments, one where we had people uh, adjust the bass and treble levels until they preferred it to a speaker that we've equalized to have a flat in-room response uh, in our reference room. And then we did the same experiment where uh, we had this relatively flat response measured at the eardrum, and then they, they would do the same experiment where they would adjust the bass and treble. And we did it two different ways. We, we were curious whether you would get a different answer if you adjusted these at the same time or whether you adjusted them one at a time. So I'm just going to talk about the two parameter adjustment. So we took a loudspeaker, which we knew to be pretty pretty flat, pretty smooth. This is a Revel F208, and this is the uh, direct sound, the listening window, the first reflections, the sound power. The black one there is actually the predicted in-room response, and then you have the two directivity indices on the bottom. So if you put that in a room, uh, you're going to hear reasonably flat direct sound, and the first reflections are going to be relatively similar, uh, although at high frequencies, the speaker's becoming directional, so you see it falls off. So we went into the room and we measured that speaker, and then uh, we did the same thing. We put a, uh, a uh, our ear simulator in the room and matched the headphone response to uh, that same in-room target. And this is, the, this is the headphone, the HD800, without any equalization. So that's how it measures without any EQ applied. So again, we went into this room, and uh, this time we just measured it with, using two loudspeakers. We did a spatial average. And this is the speaker uh, before EQ measured in the room, and then we basically equalize it so it has a flat in-room response. So this is what the headphone looks like after we've equalized it to that target response. So the experiment involved people making adjustments <coughs> in the bass and the treble. And they did it in quarter dB increments. We would basically start the level. We would randomize the starting level, and then they would make this adjustment, uh, repeat it several times, so we get a measure of how accurate they are. And we chose these two filters uh, based on 105 hertz is roughly where you know, room gain starts to occur, depending on the room. And then we have the shelving filter, which sort of simulates the, uh, the, the directivity of a of a forward-facing loudspeaker. And we, we wrote a little piece of software, uh, and we used these knobs made by Griffin where they have no uh, 
they're basically endless knobs, so there's no bias uh, and there's no indents in them. So you can't basically go one, two, three, four, five, six clicks. Uh, uh, you basically never know where the knob is because you you randomize the uh, the buffer and the starting point. So so these these are cool devices for doing these types of types of experiments. And uh, we used two of them when, so they could do the treble and the bass at the same time. So again, this was done with 11 listeners. Uh, eight of them were trained. Three of them were untrained. Uh, we'd like to have had more, but uh, these, these were the only ones we could uh, find at the time. I said one bass player because this guy tended to turn the bass up really high. <laughs> If we brought in a flute player, maybe he would turn the treble up really high, I don't know. <laughs> so we, d we had three different programs, and this is the spectrum, uh, long-term spectrum analysis of those programs. So I just want to show you that these programs have lots of bass, and they're pretty full bandwidth, and they're not that dissimilar. Uh, one of them, Steely Dan, has a little more bass than the other two, but that's, uh, that's at like 30 hertz, below 30 hertz. So we did this uh, 27 trials, three programs with nine repeats so we could really uh, get a measure of how accurate and how repeatable they are. So I'll just focus on these. Uh, and keep in mind these untrained listeners, there's only three of them, so we can't be too conclusive here. But these are the average treble, uh, bass levels and treble levels for the train listeners. So on, on average, they turned up the bass about 4.7 dB, and they turned down the shelving filter and the treble minus four. And the untrained listeners, you can see they turned the bass up a lot more, and they also turned the treble up more. So the, right away, this was kind of disturbing that these untrained listeners would crank the bass. Maybe they're future beat, Beats headphone owners, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or it's find a, hard to find a trained bass player. Yeah. <laughs> Were they uh, trained in how to put the headphones on? We discussed earlier that Pittman affects bass quality. Yeah. Yeah, and the bass player maybe had a big head or a, or a small head. I don't know. That's, that's the lead guitar player. Yeah. I think we did. I think we're breaking a lot of rules here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you, you pointed out a leakage, but the, these headphones, the Sennheiser HD 800, are very, very consistent. Uh, probably one of the most consistent phones that I've tested. You test it on listeners, and it's very consistent when you measure at, you know, at the block now. So I, I don't know how much leakage really had to do with this. One thing that after we did the experiment, we thought that maybe some of these listeners were simply turning it up because it wasn't loud enough. Yeah. Yeah. So how much of it is tone, uh, timbre, and how much of it is I just want to hear it louder. So if I were to repeat this, I would probably include a volume adjustment to begin with, and once they are at their preferred volume or level, then I would have them do this and see whether I get more consistent results. I don't what, know. What was the sound level that they were so experiencing this at? It was adjusted to about 80, it's sort of an average level, comfortable, about 80 dBB weighted. All of them? Yeah. Yeah. The other interesting thing we found that. Uh, these are the results for trained listeners with the uh, headphones. You already. <coughs> but we found that when they were listening to loudspeakers, the untrained listeners really cranked the bass, 11 dB. And of course, they're turning up the treble as well. So there seemed to be a, an interaction between the playback and how much bass and treble. And it seemed to vary depending, just it was mostly. Uh, isolated to untrained listeners. So there's definitely something going on here with uh, these untrained listeners. <coughs> Looks like a num one of the numbers up there was off. One of the numbers is off? I thought, I thought so. So I thought the, uh, the untrained, untrained was, a, the untrained was a, a minus, but it was a plus on this. Oh, you're right. Isn't that 
Right. And it was also the same as that other. Yeah, I'll, I'll look at that. Yeah, that one there. It's also the same as the other one. Loudspeaker was 1.8. I don't know. Yeah, you're right. I'll have to look at the. Hopefully, I got it right in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's the results for the individual listeners, and the ones on the these large numbers are the untrained listeners. So, uh, and these lower numbers are people who are more trained. So here's the average preferred base levels for speakers with, uh, with the individual listeners. So you can see there's a bit of variation here from listener to listener uh, with this task. And these are the preferred treble levels. So again, there's some variation here uh, among the listeners. And this is for loudspeakers. The next one is for headphones. and. These are treble, treble, preferred treble levels for headphones. So you can see the trained listeners, the preferred bass levels tracking fairly well, even though there's some differences among the listeners. And the same is true with uh, the treble, but the untrained listeners tended to crank the bass for the speakers and crank the treble as well compared to the trained listeners. So. Then the interesting thing is when you look at the delta, so that's the difference between the preferred bass and treble, you can find that there's less, less of an effect between the headphone and, and the loudspeaker playback. So it seems as though if you're cranking the bass up 10 dB, but you also crank the treble up you know, 10 dB or 4 dB, uh, it tends to track well. So the difference between the bass and the treble level tends to track really well across these two conditions. So I don't know if there's anything to that, but it was kind of interesting. So if you, if you look at all the data, uh, what we have here is the preferred target response of the loudspeaker uh, in black. And the blue or magenta is the one, for the preferred level for headphones. So there's, there's about a 2 dB difference. And this is the preferred target response uh, of the loudspeaker measured at the, uh, the eardrum. So you can see there's a bass boost. And what this tells us is that, you know, this idea that you should equalize the speaker to be flat in the room doesn't really uh, sit well with listeners. They want to hear a certain amount of room gain. The other interesting thing, so what we have here is the, uh, the in-room response of the, uh, the in-room target from a previous paper. That's the red curve. So that's what people uh, preferred in a previous study where we were looking at room correction. And in this study, uh, the black one is the rebel equalized to the new target. So there's, there's very little difference between those two curves. So it seems <clears throat> from a less scientific uh, standpoint, we were able to, uh, we were pretty close to what people prefer when you do a more rigorous study. And this curve is basically the predicted uh, in-room response based on anechoic data. So if you look at the previous graph, this black curve is basically uh, the predicted in-room response based on anechoic measurements. And when you put the speaker in the room, you're pretty well hitting that curve, except below about 100 hertz. And you can see uh, in a room, there's a certain amount of room gain, uh, and the anechoic data can't predict that because it doesn't know what type of room it's going in. So it's pretty, but, but above about 100 hertz, uh, there's really not much need to do anything to the speaker. Uh, just let it do uh, what it's doing, and you really only have to address the low frequency portion. So that's kind of cool.
So the in-room response uh, for the speaker that was preferred is not flat, but it has a base boost of about 6.6 .6 dB and a treble cut of 2.4 dB, which is pretty well nothing. You just leave the speaker alone. Uh, the general shape of the in-room approximates the sound power of the speaker, of a well-designed speaker. And a, below 200 hertz, people pref they expect <coughs> to hear a certain amount of room gain, probably because the room game was accounted for when it was when the recording was made. Okay. So, question? Yeah. If you had repeated that at a 10 dB louder listening level, and again at a 10 dB lower listening level, would you get the same targets? Maybe not. I don't. It's a good question. It, that's that's a study that needs to be done. How much do you suspect? Um, uh, I don't know what the right term would be, but maybe. Uh, or familiarization plays into the preference, like, you know, the fact that people have been listening to speakers in rooms that aren't treated, that aren't acoustically perfect, and therefore have uneven response and room game problems all over the place, they've been patterned to find something that they find, like, like oh, this is what I'm used to. And so when they go into a new environment, they try to find a sound, you know, curve that matches sort of what they're used to, maybe as a bias that's just carried with them and they can't divorce themselves from. No, um, it could be a factor, but the, the fact that these, you know, the listen, the train listeners, you would think, would sort of converge, since through training and experience for doing these tests in, in a fairly standard room, that they would more or less agree. That, but even in this study, we found that uh, there, was, there was a fair amount of variation. And interestingly, Todd Welty uh, was. You know, the guy who wrote all these papers on rooms and bass and how to optimize your subwoofers for the best bass, well, he turned down the bass among you know, the lowest among all the listeners. So, <laughs> so whenever Todd does an experiment, I say, well, of course you don't like it. It, it has uh, too much bass. He, he likes very, you know, one or two dB of bass boost. That's it. And the average is about I think it was about 6 dB in a room. So, so there are individual uh, preferences, I think, in base. So the next experiment, uh, we, were, we were getting tired of doing these very, uh, when we're doing benchmarking of headphones, uh, it's very tedious uh, doing all the substitution of different headphones. And of course, you still have these nuisance variables of the, the weight and the, the feel. So we came up with this, uh, this virtual method where uh, we said, what if we measure these headphones on a near simulator and then uh, basically simulate them through a single headphone, the replicator headphone, so that it, the equalization produces the same response as measured on the original headphone. So the idea is you, you measure a headphone <coughs> Uh, you measure it at the eardrum using this uh, grass ear simulator. Then you design a filter to emulate that. You apply it and uh, with EQ. And so when you do that, you can listen to the, basically the target headphone through the simulated phone. And the, the, the great <clears throat> advantage is it's very fast, very efficient. You can very quickly switch between different headphones. It's truly double blind. Uh, you can actually, uh, once you measure the headphones, you can store them and anyone can listen to them. You don't have to ship headphones around the world. But the problem is that it doesn't include uh, nonlinear distortion. So if, if the headphone, if you're really pushing it or it has a lot of distortion, you're not including that in the simulation. And then the other thing is you're not simulating uh, fitment leakage issues. So you, you, they put on a pair of headphones and you hit a button, you say, here's the Beats, here's the Bose. They're listening to that, the same uh, frequency response. I got you. Yeah. You have a calibrated headphone and they yeah. adjust the curve. Yeah, you have to calibrate the, right. the simulator phone. Okay. And the okay. program was the three things that you identified earlier? I haven't talked about that yet. But, so we tested this, whether this works by using different music programs 
play through these virtual headphones compared to the, the actual physical headphones. Mm -hmm. That's what this, this is a validation experiment that we did. Question? Yeah. I assume you used the DSP-based EQ? Yeah. I'm curious to know, with all this equalization you're doing, was there any compensation done for the variations in phase that would have happened with all those filters being applied? So that people were not only hearing the same uh, spectral response, but they were hearing the same phase response as well. Yeah, we, you know, we're, we're making assumptions up to a certain frequency that it, it's, a, it's a minimum phase uh, equal, uh, headphone, and that if, we, if we're applying equalizations, that we're also including the phase. But we didn't, to answer your question, we didn't really go out and try to match the phase response <coughs> perfectly that, uh, that the real headphone had. Was there anything interesting about playing back the captures from the air simulator through speakers again? Oh, we didn't play these back through speakers. I mean, I wonder if there would be inter anything interesting if you did that. So, so what would... This ear simulator is a stereo, two microphones, right? The, uh, you're talking about the, the way we measured them? Yeah, they're two mic... It's basically a head or pinna, two pinna with yeah. microphones, so... I'm just thinking you could record that and play it back through a speaker. I wonder oh, yeah, we, interesting. We, yeah, we... In the, not, in the distortion experiment that I'm not going to talk about tonight, that's what we did. We made recordings of different headphones at different playback levels and evaluate those recordings. Uh, so anyway, here's the, here's the six headphones that we uh, virtualized, and these are headphones that we'd already tested. And here's the, the response of the real headphones shown as uh, dotted lines, and this is the simulator headphone equalized to simulate it. You can see they're pretty pretty accurate up to about 10 kilohertz. And above 10 kilohertz, uh, there's a lot of measurement error, uh, do, you know, how you position the headphone on the pen. Home filtering, does that come into play? These, yeah. these measurements? Yeah, at very high frequencies, the bounce between. Well, there, there's a lot of reflections inside the ear canal, so yeah, there's, <coughs> the, you know, it's, all this jagged response is, uh, reflections inside the ear, resonances in the transducer. It's a combination of those two things. And if you do some uh, averages, recedings of the headphone, you can minimize some of those interference effects. So pretty, pretty good uh, accuracy up to about 10 kilohertz. So the first thing when we looked at the results from the listening test is that on average people tended to rate things higher. They used higher ratings when they were listening to the physical headphones versus the virtual versions. Hmm. Are these trained listeners now? Yeah, these are trained. So here's the, <clears throat> the mean ratings for the virtual headphones. So yeah, the virtual and the standard. So the overall correlation is about 0.85, but there there are some differences. And this is this happens to be the uh, the Audi. So this is the heavy headphone with the high clamping force. So we wondered whether some of these differences are due to that bias. And this other headphone <clears throat> was the closed one that we, we had leakage effects and uh, it was rated a little higher in the virtual method uh, <coughs> relative to HP3, for example. And we thought maybe in the virtual method, the leakage effect is obviously not such a factor. And in the real test, the standard method, it was. But the overall uh, trend is very similar. So these are the individual listener preferences, and I've shown the correlation between standard and virtual. <clears throat> and you can see that for some listeners, the correlation is very high. Uh, for one listener in particular, there wasn't particularly, it was very low correlation. And the overall correlation averaged across seven listeners was 0.85. HP5, there seems to be quite a big uh, difference for most of the listeners between the virtual and the standard. They rated a lot lower with virtual. Yeah. Any, any thoughts about that? Or? That's an active noise cancellation mm -hmm. headphone, so that might have been a factor. Uh, 
we found that some of these active noise phones are quite finicky, depending on how you position them. And Was your low correlation your untrained listener? One of them? Uh, these were all trained listeners. Oh, okay. uh, this one here in particular was less trained. Uh, <laughs> What's your definition of a trained <coughs> experience? Well, we have this software we've written called uh, How to Listen. And it's, uh, it's available on the web. You can download it. Is it has anyone here tried it? Yes, a little bit. So it, it's, uh, it basically introduces distortions to program, and you have to identify, you know, if it's a spectral distortion, where, what the frequency band is, and if you get it right, it gets more and more difficult. So uh, we define trained as getting up to skill level seven or higher. Sean? Yeah. Go back to that previous one. That looks... Surprisingly, like some results I've seen um, testing some of the audio codecs, that, that specifically a change that seem to be related in some people to imaging. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea if it has anything to do with it, but that the same heavy variation seems to relate between pre echo and, and imaging sensitive people. Those are, tend to be two different axes. Yeah. I just wonder if you have something. It wouldn't be those characteristics, but I just wonder if you have something like that in terms of pen and shape or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I. It's you know how do you how do you verify that the the match is actually a match for any given person? Well, you don't. I mean, I. That's the problem. In, in, in my slide, I said this method doesn't. Uh, oh, yeah. It doesn't accurately simulate leakage. Yeah. Fitment. Now it could if we if we individually measured every listener uh, yeah. instead of measuring it on a uh, yeah. a grass coupler, we could actually measure it on a listener and then implement those filters. For the, the, then we probably would get better correlation for some listeners. That'd be an awful, awful lot. That'd be a lot of work. <laughs> so here I show the individual listeners. These are the. Uh, uh, sorry, it's not the individual listeners. These are the virtual and standard uh, perceived spectral balances for those six headphones. So uh, pretty good correlation for some of them. HP2, HP3, uh, pretty poor one for HP1. This is the, this is the odd D's headphone. So uh, we're not sure why uh, in the virtual method it sounded thinner and a little brighter, uh, but it's something that needs to be repeated. Could, uh, I, I'm just thinking, and I don't know, but could different materials in the drivers themselves, like some drivers are magnesium, some are aluminum, could that affect, I don't know the difference, I don't know specifically on the odd disease ones. It's a magnetic planar driver, so um, it's, uh, okay. it's, it's different from the others, but Apart from frequency response and distortion, they resonate differently. Though, yeah, but that should like show up in the that. frequency response. Uh, if if you have a resonance, well, or the other materials in the actual headphone, would that affect? I'm just. I'm just it it, it just will affect the frequency response, but as long as we are accurately capturing that, it should. Yeah. You just, you just stuck up the thought in my head. Did any of these headphones seem to have some non-minimum non phase characteristics? Because that, if you match a non-minimum phase with a minimum phase filter, you can get some weird crap. Yeah. Especially if the headphones that you're using for the reference headphones have the non-minimum phase. And yeah, what yeah. cables were you using with those? <laughs> <laughs> we, we're, uh, we're using the cables supplied by the manufacturer. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. How did you simulate that? <laughs> you burnt a lot of money. So. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this one, but we did do a little study where we brought in some college kids 
And I'm not going to talk about it because we've done a, a bigger one since this one was done. <coughs> but I'm just going to go back to a paper that was done two years ago where we had uh, uh, this was motivated by some some reports in the press about <laughs> audio is, is doomsday press here that kids prefer MP, low bit MP3 and terrible headphones and earbuds yeah. and uh, it was it was getting reported in the New York Times so I started getting calls from executives saying why are we doing research on sound quality when <laughs> kids don't give a damn <laughs> So it turns out it was this guy at Stanford, and it just goes to show you if you throw a big name behind your, uh, it'll get published in the New York Times. But he basically was testing students, music students, over seven years, and he found more and more they would prefer MP3 at 128 verse over the original CD lossless version. And it turned out it was never published, uh, peer, it was never peer reviewed. I tried to contact him and I couldn't get uh, a return phone call. <laughs> and, uh, and yet. Is it possible he was misquoted by the press? That never happens. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ask me about that. Yeah. yeah, just watch the film Distortion of Sound and you'll see lots of misquotes. And, It's John Berger. So, so anyway, I, I decided to do a study because I always get people wanting to come on field trips. So we had high school students, three different colleges. And they all had different levels of experience. And we had uh, master students who were actually doing listener training, so I called them the most. We had students with no experience, some visual arts students that had no audio experience. And we did this, uh, this <coughs> test. It was just an A-B test uh, where I took some music and encoded it in MP3 at 128 to simulate what Berger was doing. And, uh, they went through nine trials. And we found overall the, uh, the master students preferred CD in 86% of the trials, but none of them were uh, below 50%. So they were choosing CD quality over MP3 most of the time. And it was really related to their training. If you looked at the individual listeners, uh, all of them are pretty well above 50%. The more experienced ones are up, up near 100%. So there's no preference at all for MP3. So what was the playback primary you used? Uh, these were JBL LSR 6332s. So they weren't iTunes or iPhone AirPods? This is, no, this is uh, stereo, high quality stereo playback. Right. Yeah. I'm just kind of curious if Berger's test was through like an iPhone. We don't know because he never published the study. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. So it may be that there is no perceivable difference with earbuds that he has to yeah. run. But in a high buy system, high sensitivity. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that would be an interesting study. I don't know if anyone's done it. How does the fidelity of the playback chain affect? I would posit that most visual arts students listen to music while they're working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. The next thing, while they were there, I wondered if they preferred accurate loudspeakers. So I, I threw these people into a, a loudspeaker test, and I also had some visiting college students from Japan. And I was interested in their opinions, because at the time, we, one of our customers in Japan was arguing that we need to tune our cars differently for the Japanese market than the US market, because Japanese people like less bass and more mid-range. So uh, we had these four loudspeakers ranging in price from $500 to $3,800. And we have this cool room where you go in and the computer starts up the test. Uh, you have a curtain here. You don't know what's behind the curtain. And there's a pneumatic speaker shuffler that puts each speaker in the exact same position. So we completely remove positional effects because every speaker is in the same position.
So, so these are the individual groups. I'm just going to click through them. So these are the high school students, Japanese group number one, Japanese group number two, Cal Arts, the visual arts students, the Loyola Marymount students, and the UC Irvine, and the last group are the Harmon listeners. And you can see that regardless of training, age, whether they're Japanese or American, uh, there's a pretty consistent preference here. Uh, the more trained listeners tend to rate things lower on the scale, and that's pretty consistent with every study I've ever done. Uh, people who are less trained tend to rate things higher, and their range tends to be smaller, so they're, they're less discriminating. The nice thing about this is that these are the anechoic data, and you can, you can pick the winners just looking at these graphs. So this is the this is the infinity speaker, very flat on axis, very smooth. This is a competitor speaker. They the marketing department believes it should have a smiley face. <laughs> but when the listeners hear it, it's the inverse. It's, you'd have to flip it over. <laughs> this is a speaker that's designed for very high efficiency in the mid-range. So when you go in the Best Buy, it's the loudest speaker on the floor. But listeners actually say it sounds thin like a bookshelf speaker because it's got uh, the base mid-range is 6 dB lower than the treble. Okay, with that jump. This is uh, what that Floyd calls a, a waste of natural resources. <laughs> <laughs> it's got lots of resonances. It's very colorful and it, th there's no low bass. And uh, when you go off axis, uh, this is a speaker for a a, uh, it only sounds good in one spot, so it's for a, a divorced or bachelor <laughs> audiophile who has no friends. <laughs> now are you going to identify which one's which? Well, <laughs> yeah, you can, if you go back, that's the order. <laughs> So let me. Oh, that's smart stuff. <laughs> so I, the reason I'm showing you this is that history repeats itself, and you know we've shown with speakers that it's you know good good loudspeaker sound is pretty universal, whether you're trained, untrained, or from different countries. And so why would it be different for headphones? Well. <laughs> It's a good thing for marketing because I can just keep doing these studies over and over again. Nice. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Three minutes. Three minutes. Can, I, can I make this in three minutes? Excuse me, two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this is a study that we haven't presented yet. It's going to be presented in a few weeks. Uh, why are we doing this? Because, again, uh, there's this hugely successful headphone. Uh, which people believe is maybe related to the sound. I think it's related to celebrity and marketing. So we did this study in uh, four different countries, and it's by no means a, a, a large sample that's balanced or anything like that. 